He can't. He also was very poor, like Jackson. His views on slavery were actually unknown. He came out relatively for slavery because the Democratic Party was split and wanted to keep the party unified. He would keep his real opinions, you know, very close. And so, Van Buren was nicknamed Old Kinderhook. It's a little tiny county in New York where he grew up in. A little, little county, very poor. He was Old Kinderhook. And they just simply avoided Texas. They avoided it, hoping to kind of sneak in. The Whigs ran three candidates. Harrison, Dwight, and Webster, thinking that if we split up the vote, the Electoral College won't be in the majority, and maybe we can go to the House. But it didn't work. Did you say he's Jackson's vice president? Yeah, Jackson's vice president. Van Buren was elected, this New Yorker. Harrison did the best for the Whigs. Remember, he's for the Battle of Tippy Canoe, Old Tippy was known as, and the Battle of the Thames, where Tecumseh died. And so Harrison did pretty well. But the problem for Van Buren was... And the country, right after he's elected, things would fall apart. So let's very quickly go into the Van Buren administration. Remember the panic of 1837. And the Whigs immediately dubbed it, get it? Van Buren, get it? Aha. Aha. Okay, so. And he no one had any idea what to do. It was so new, and it affected areas so vastly differently, it was just a confusion. He didn't bring back the bank, but it was replaced by a sub-treasury or something that's called the independent treasury that would be outside the banking system, and it would last till 1913 in some form. Actually, parts of it are really good, parts of it were flawed because they didn't finish it. It's, it's one of those interesting what ifs that they would have kept it. But other than that, his presidency was hampered by the Depression. And Texas, it was so controversial, and after the panic, Van Buren couldn't make a decision on it because it would offend Northern Democrats fearful of slave power. You don't need to know Richard Mentor Johnson as vice president. I just put him up there, though, because he wanted Texas. He was this Westerner, and it showed the divide in the Democratic Party because Westerners wanted it, Northerners didn't. But also, it's going to add his little campaign slogan. These were brand new. He was at the Battle of the Thames, and he took credit for killing Tecumseh, even though almost certainly he didn't. Now, I'm not exactly sure how they said Rumpsy, but does anyone see Rumpsy there? So we get Rumpsy, Dumpsy, Rumpsy, Dumpsy, Colonel Johnson killed Tecumseh. <laughs> that doesn't really rhyme the way you would think. Maybe they said Rumpsa? I don't know, but it was Tecumseh. Is that Martin Van Buren? Yeah, that's Van Buren. Okay. That's actually him about 10 years after that. But Aren't they supposed to make him look like pretty or young Martin Van Buren? That's a portrait. Like that's a photograph. That's a photograph. Oh, really? mm -hmm. That's the 1840s. So it's about 12 years after he was president. How about that? Is that a photograph? That's a painting. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, what? He was. They, they. They probably were trying to make him look. Okay. So Martin Van Buren, by default, the Democrats had to choose him to be their nominee, and once again. They left Texas in the air. We should have it, but we'll wait for what the Mexicans say. Because the Democratic Party was so bitterly divided. Northern Democrats did not want slave power. And this is a cartoon show or a painting showing how awful the panic was. Drunkenness, waiting for a job, a panic on the bank, that kind of thing. So Van Buren's candidacy was in trouble right away. A lot of uh, Democrats didn't want him, but they felt stuck because he was a sitting president. I should add that candidates, remember, they did not campaign for themselves. Newspapers and and their like surrogates would run for them. Editors of newspapers would put and they would put out handbills. But it's not the beginnings of a modern campaign will be this election, but it's not quite today. Yeah. What is the beginning? Democrat. Uh, and I don't know why I've meant to put hyphen, but I must have put it. Then I just left it. So with that, the Whigs. They picked the person who did the best in that election. William of 1836. William Henry Harrison, old tip, the victor of Tippy Canoe, a Westerner, rough hewn Westerner, and they thought we have our Jackson. And that's what the Whigs did. The Whigs thought if we could find somebody who's like Jackson, the Westerner, a general, a frontiersman, 
they could get some of the Democrats to vote for the Whigs, even though Harrison does not support the same policy of the Democrats. And that's what they did. He's old Tip, the Battle of the Thames, the Battle of Tippy Canoe, which was 29 years ago. So they avoided all the issues and just ran as war hero. They tried to get their Jackson. Does everybody catch what I mean? Get their Jackson to fool just enough voters. And the Democrats thought that being impossible. Yet in secret, everybody believed, and it turned out to be true, Harrison, for the most part, supported basic Whig policies. The American system, protecting tariff, bank, internal improvements. Basically to help the new capitalists. And so Harrison is going to be mocked as being nothing more than a puppet. By the way, this is a creepy cartoon. It? Marinette, but there's uh, Webster and that's Clay. And they were like controlling him from behind. Yet Harrison, all he ran on was his being a war hero and a Westerner. So if anybody asked him, what about Texas? He would respond with the Battle of Tippy Canoe. Right? I want a Tippy Canoe, so let's talk about that. Well, what about the tariff? The Battle of the Thames. And that's what he did. And it was really effective. Remember, they might not get all the Democrats, and the Democrats were a bigger party, but they, can they get enough to say he's like us? But actually, he was from one of the richest families in Virginia and had a massive farm slash plantation on the Indiana and also went into Kentucky across the river. Or he was one of the wealthiest men in the West, yet he betrayed himself and from one of the richest families. So he didn't he inherited a lot of this. He betrayed somebody else. And when that was going on, then he's a northerner. Even though I know it's from the families from Virginia, but he was portrayed himself as northern Whig policy of helping business. So they needed a southerner. And that's where we get to one of the first great, oh, almost forgot. Gosh, I forgot to say something. They first tried this. Remember Davy Crockett? That's how Pop and Davy Crockett became famous. It wasn't the Alamo. The early Whigs tried to prop Davy Crockett up as an Andrew Jackson. This Westerner, he had all these tall tales about him. He's really good at telling stories about himself, about all the things he did. In fact, how old was he when he killed a bear? Oh, we gotta listen to the song again. Davy, Davy Crockett, the king of the wild frontier. Born on the mountaintop of Tennessee, the greenest state in the land of the free. Raised in the woods so they knew every tree, and killed him a bar when he was only three. Only three! Davy Crockett, the king of the wild frontier. So, <laughs> and so they tried Davy Crockett as the Whig who would act like Jackson to steal away that vote. It didn't work because Davy Crockett. Oh, by the way, this was a cartoon, a comic book from the nineteen from the eighteen forties. Push. No, okay, this is nineteen fifties, but I just thought it was kind of cool. And I know what you're thinking. And yes, you could buy a Lego Davy Crockett. Yeah, I know. You have one? No. I'm so jealous. <laughs> yeah? Oh! I'll tell you. Wait, so is he also running the new election of 1840? No, he's dead. Okay, that's what I thought. But <laughs> my point is the Whigs who tried with the image didn't work because Davy Crockett turned out to be not fully believing in Whig policy. And he was kind of adult. Why do you think it's just Jackson? Huh? Well, Jackson's, Jackson's a Democrat. Democrat. Hates him. Oh. Jackson believes in different policy. <laughs> they they don't things. want to do democratic policy, but they want to find someone who can appeal to the Democrat. Like now, I'll tell you, someone who did it really well was Richard Nixon, who would do the same thing. Yeah, that's a that's a joke. And they, yeah, student made it for me. They even laminated that. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but Nixon would do the same thing to appeal to uh, working class union Democrats and always vote a Republican before that. But anyways, back to this. They tried, it failed. That's why he went to Texas, because 
the Whigs dropped their support and he lost for re-election in the Congress and he was trying to rehabilitate his image. That's why he went to Texas and that's why he died at the Alamo. By the way, this is what we call a Davy Crockett. So in the 1950s, the US Army, they wanted their own nuclear weapons. They were mad that only the Air Force did it. And uh, the, the Air Force and the Navy had nuclear weapons. And they want nuclear weapons. That's why they would have artillery shells that would fire nuclear weapons. And this is the most crazy nuclear weapon in the history of, and all nuclear weapons are pretty crazy, but this is unreal. They would they'd be fired by an anti-tank gun. So it only had a range of about three or four miles and it fired a seven kiloton nuclear weapon. That's about half, yeah, the Lego, half the size of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And it was a really dirty bomb, so that means it put out a lot of radiation, especially when it hit the ground and created what's called fallout. And it was just a terrible weapon. And they put these in West Germany to defend against Soviet attack. And the weapon is just crazy. And these, they kept them with these, in fact, they had them out there and they're practicing into the 1970s, and it would have dropped when it very well could have exploded right there because they had almost no safety features. It was insane. Not only that, but what would happen to the crew when they fired one? If they didn't get blown away by the blast, they would die a horrific death about two or three days later from radiation sickness. Wait, what does this have to do with Davy Crockett? They called it the Davy Crockett. Because they wanted a name for it. They called it David Crockett. <laughs> so I just put that in there because I thought that was just one of the most amazing Things. It also shows the insanity of the Cold War, and one of, something I'll say again, especially when we're in April talking about the Cold War, it's a miracle we're here. Because the same people who thought this was a good idea were in charge. <laughs> Moving on, John Tyler was his choice, well not his choice, the way choice. And that's where you get one of the great campaign slogans in history, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Rolls off the tongue. In fact, it's one of the most remembered and the first real famous presidential slogans because now they're selling the president. Remember the whole thing about acting like Jackson? That's selling him, not reality. And that's part of the reason why Tippy Canoe, people would forget what an important battle was because it kind of had this comical sound to this election slogan. Some of you probably even heard Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. John Tyler was a Southern senator from Virginia who hated Clay's American system. He was for nullification of the tariff, but he hated the democracy and that's why he was a Whig. So he opposed everything that Harrison, well, Clay and Webster supported. But you know what, he's just vice president. It doesn't really matter, right? right? what do vice presidents do? They break ties in the Senate and wait for the president to what? Die. Die. Nothing to see here. Moving on. But hmm? I don't know. We're not there yet. Oh, um, no. So Tyler's the vice president. Yeah, Tyler's the vice president. Oh. Harrison's. He wins. Does he? Yeah, Harrison's. Harrison's the presidential candidate. We're not there yet. Oh. So. So now we're at the time where you're running for vice president. Yeah, they're running for president. No, for vice president, and not just second vice No, actually, they're picked by the convention, the Whig convention. And so the other Whigs pick Tyler. Basically, it's Clay and Webster who pushed him through the Whig convention, saying, "We need a southerner. We need a southerner to balance off with the Harrison who is more of a northern Whig." They don't do it anymore. Like it's like the second highest vote comes in Westbrook. Yeah, that the they changed the constitution right after Je Jefferson was. Uh oh. Yeah. So Harrison won the election. We're not there. We're not there. It's still the campaign. Yeah. I was just asking, like, how do you think our vice president would be today? Like, for the. Well, you know, they're elected on a ticket, but the parties now, the way they've been doing it now, basically, they kind of started in the 1950s, 40s and 50s, but they basically, the whoever's going to win the nomination will pick somewhere. And almost always then they're confirmed by the convention. The last time the convention picked somebody was 1952. Yeah, so it's been a while. So this would soon be dubbed the Law Cabin Campaign. And the reason this campaign is so important is because a Democratic newspaper mocking Harrison's reputation, his age, 
the fact that he really wasn't a Democrat, but also mocking the fact that they believe he didn't know anything. He was seen as a lightweight and not very smart, which very well could be. But in this newspaper, they said William Henry Harrison would rather sit on the front porch of his log cabin and drink hard cider than understand the real issues facing the country today. Now, do you think he lived in a log cabin? What kind of home do you think he lived in? He had a mansion, the biggest home in Indiana. That's what he lived in. He was incredibly rich. He didn't drink hard cider, which was the drink of common folk. He drank wine or champagne or whatever it might be if he wanted to have that. And so they're mocking him for this, but that's not him. How did the, the Whigs react to this newspaper ad? No, because I'm there pretending he was a common man. Exactly. That's exactly right. The Whigs were overjoyed. Thank you. That's what we want people to believe. And that's what we got to get. The Democrats attacked him for the law, living in a log cabin, and the Whigs embraced it. Isn't that clever of them? And how foolish of the Democrats to fall for the trap. Because now the, the Whigs could turn around and say, look at those elitist Democrats. Which was the whole reason for the Democratic Party was to fight the elites. And it flipped on them by an elite. And they quickly built a lock cabin on his, his, uh, his plantation. They got a rocking chair where he could sit at a barrel of hard cider. And reporters would come and campaign, but they would come in and they would see him there and talk about it. And they made up this whole story. Soon there'd be pictures and lithographs put up. And people would have this uh, log cabins and look at him. There's a man of the people in the woods with hard cider. Same thing here in the Whig Almanac. They pushed it to the hill. And then they turned around and said, Martin Van Buren, who was born about as poor as any American president was born, he was the elite. This creepy picture. <laughs> this creepy thing. Okay, get this. You ever seen those? Uh, he looked through like a stereoscope. He looked through two eyes or two things. You see like a 3D vision of it. When I was a kid, you probably see it be like little click, oh, yeah, little yeah, pictures, yeah. stereoscopes. They don't name for it, but that's the old name for it. If you look through them, and if you turned them, so you had this picture. This was the front, that's the back, and you turned it real fast. It gave kind of the image of like 3D but motion. Hey, 1840, why not, right? So here it is, Martin Van Buren enjoying sham. A goblet of champagne like the elite. That's why it's WBB. Here's WHH. But you give them a glass of common working man's apple or hard cider and look at his face. <laughs> now, Democrats are like, how can you buy this? It's so polite. It's so obviously not true. Nobody would ever believe this. But remember, they didn't need everybody. Just people on the margins. That's the thing about elections. With a winner-take-all system we have in the United States, who decides elections are people on the margins. And many of those people don't pay attention. And they're the ones who fall for. And I mentioned this before. Let me go back to this. They're the ones who fall for image. Image will be the important thing here, not reality. And this is why this would be the first modern campaign, where they'll sell a candidate, not for what he really is, but for what they want people to believe. In 1840, the Whigs hit the right moment. They wanted this rough-hewn Westerner, or enough people did. They wanted that, and they found somebody who could betray that image. That wasn't the reality, but it doesn't matter. And so you use the media. Lithographs, the printing press, newspapers, telegraph, and think about the 20th century. Radio, and then the big television. Television will change everything. You literally have commercials for them and sell a candidate for office like you're selling toothpaste. And then think about today, where there's so many different ways that media hits you in the face over and over again. What a great way to sell an image. Remember what I told you how people don't know they can be manipulated, and this is how. If you aren't sure and don't know the, the details of it, you could be fooled by a fake image of somebody. Richard Nixon was able to be a president that actually went against policies for working people. 
for union workers and for wage workers, yet he sold himself as defending them. What was the image? Against the hippies and the for those protesting for civil rights, for equal rights for women. That's what he did, and it worked really well. In your lifetime, who was president when you were born? Bush was a very wealthy man from a very wealthy elite, old well, uh, family called uh, the Bushes, the Prescotts, the Pierces, very wealthy family. Yet he portrayed himself as kind of a farmer, a westerner. In fact, right, right after he's elected president, they bought a ranch. What about so he, Obama? Huh? What about Obama? Well, we'll get to Obama, Obama a little bit, but more him because this was a complete opposite for Bush. And they had pictures of him with a chainsaw out there, cutting wood. Yeah, Obama came from a very humble background, but they could kind of create an image for him because he had no real voting record. He'd only been in the Senate for two years when he announced he was president. So they could create an image for him because he didn't have a record. Now, he really did come from very humble backgrounds, but then again, he kind of, he did have uh, a little bit of kind of combined humble and elite. President Trump is really good at it. I mean, he's one of the most elite presidents in American history. From the absolute topper, top topper, and top upper crust, and yet a lot of people um, think that he's very much like a representing working people. Now, it doesn't mean his policies aren't good or bad. That's not the point. The point is, he's not really bad, but a lot of people believe he is. It's really effective. It's, I mean, think about it for a second, how easy it is, and it's happening right now. In fact, when you get a, somebody who's candidate for office or something like that who isn't pushing the image and pushing about what they do and what they believe in, it's almost weird now. It's like, oh, God, that's weird. We're actually having a couple that are doing that right now, and it's uh, the media does not to deal with them. Yeah. So are you a wage worker? Like, are basically like, you're oh, yeah. I mean, I I get a salary, but it's a wage, yeah. I just mm -hmm. try to acknowledge So are people that, like, own companies that own people that aren't wage workers? You don't have an early wage? No, I'm, I'm salaried. Other workers are, are, are wage earners, but the teachers, administrators, were salaried. So we, even though it's a wage, it is a wage, it's not our wage. It's like, a, like no matter how many days you come to school, you get to be a student. Yeah. Really? Whereas like other people like the guy oh I missed Tuesday if you get paycheck So you could just take three days off as you want? Well, no. <laughs> yeah. I can get fired. I have to be here to get my pay. But yeah, I'm not so if I do any work outside at the time, which I do all the time, I get no extra pay. Mm -hmm. Or if I don't do any work outside of it, I don't get Would you also do all the work? Hmm? No. <laughs> no, I do I, I do work outside all the time. But it's part of the game. But Oh yeah, it's a game. So you can just I'm, I'm leave. A, I, I will wait. You can just time. leave like right after this class and then. Like, no, I, I have a contract. There, there's rules to your job. Yeah, there are rules. <laughs> so I feel like there's like ways. And, and one of you people would rat on me, wouldn't you? No, go ahead and go. We got you. So I heard you left early. Well, no. Okay, back to that. So it worked. It works. This image. So. uh they also like political rallies where they would go have big parades through towns. I love this one with oxen pulling a big log cabin. They'd have marching bands. They'd carry banners with log cabins. The first political buttons, as you're like a little thing you kind of clip onto your lapel, a log cabin people started wearing. The first time in history, so the beginnings of a modern campaign, they have that had this big ball. There are a few of them that they would roll from town to town and had slogans on it like. The Democratic ball sent on to guide the ship, old tip. And they would all cheer and they come up and they bring people out. And at the end of the parade route, so they make a big weight parade, there'd be barrels and barrels and barrels of hard cider. <laughs> but a hard cider. And then they all drink the hard cider. And then who got you the hard cider? The wig. They use so much hard cider from one distillery in Illinois, from one distillery, that that name of that distillery became synonymous with alcohol. To this day, anyone know? From the election of 1840, what? No, that was a, <laughs> and, and there was no brewery of that. Yeah, that hmm? no? You've heard the term. It's called booze. <laughs> that was <a> <laughs> Booze was a family name. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that weird to think about? And then he jumped to this cartoon. There are a lot of things like Jackson leading Van Buren. 
So here's Jackson, who looks very ghoulish, doesn't he? He's still alive. He's leading Van Buren, trying to lead him to the White House. But he can't get all, can't get past all the log cabins and hard cider. Go back to Kinderhook, Van Buren. And two more things about it. First off, you notice the strange pig face person right here? <laughs> What's he doing? You ever seen this? This was a big insult. So the next time somebody, like, you get mad at somebody, yeah, you do it. So you've been doing it wrong. And so you're mad at somebody, what do you want to do? You just go, yeah, and don't just stop. All right, you win. You win. One more thing. Do you catch it? Do you catch it? Van Buren supporters are like, wait a second, Van Buren. He's the true common man. He's not elite. He's one of us. He's good. He's okay. That's wrong. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Old Kinderhook. Okay. So when you ever hear okay, that comes from the election of 1840. <laughs> so we have okay food. Yeah. Okay comes from. Okay, okay for good was not around. It's not until the election of 1840. No, okay. No. That was made up after this election. <laughs> no way. Yeah, isn't it? No, I'm not kidding. Isn't that great though? Isn't that great though? The election of 1840 gave us okay boots. All right, that's good. A lot of times they would say, they would say, actually, let me tell you what they would say. A lot of times they would say, all correct. All correct. All correct. Well, all correct, they turned into all correct, all correct, old kinderbug, okay. Yeah, that's. No, I'm not kidding. So, Harrison would win. The real Harrison would win overwhelmingly. Yet, yeah, he would turn to show he's young, fit, and vigorous because he was the oldest man ever elected president. Harrison would give the, oh, this is a pretty big victory, isn't it? For a man who stood for nothing, technically. <laughs> At his inauguration, he gave the longest inaugural address in history. To this day, still. Because he was 61 years old, he wanted to prove that not only he was young, but also he's not a puppet. Now, he probably already had a disease. But going out in the very cold sleep that March morning, he probably caught a cold. He wasn't wearing his beaver belt hat. And he went to prove he was fit. He caught a cold, but almost certainly that's not what did it. What did it? It was soon as within a week bedridden. Okay. And a month into office, Harrison would be the first president to die in office. Almost certainly what killed him? Cholera. Almost certainly. Anyone that know where cholera comes from? Water. Or water that's tainted with, it's disgusting, oh, but fecal matter. Oh, hmm? oh, the. Yeah. <laughs> cholera was ravaging. 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 <laughs> was ravaging Washington, D.C., and London, and cities like that. It was a horrific disease. He wouldn't be the first president to die of cholera. But he was the first person okay, so. to die in office? Yes. Who's now the president? Tyler! <laughs> that's a picture. That's actually when he was in his late 60s, after the Civil War. One thing real quick. They they did pass Clay's American system because they just assumed Tyler would, Tyler would support that. And Tyler vetoed the Whig program. Is that John Tyler? John Tyler. Tyler, the Whig president, vetoed the Whig program. Did you catch that? They actually passed them twice, and Tyler vetoed them both times. And what happened to Tyler? The Whigs kicked him out of the party. The Whigs kicked the Whig president out of the party. And the Democrats hated him, too. So we have a president that didn't have a party. But you can just tell someone they can't be part of your party. Basically, yeah. <laughs> All his cabinet quit. So Tyler would find the one issue he thought I had to get to this spot. There, once he's out the same. What's the issue? Oh, Texas. Wait, what did he veto? So Texas, he vetoed Clay's American system. 
Remember that whole, we, we mentioned that many times. He beat those two. I should add, Tyler would be remarried in his late, his late 60s to a 21 year old woman. His last child would be born when he was 73 years old. Now, wait, oh my God. wait, wait. <laughs> His granddaughter is still alive, 91 years old. Isn't that amazing? Don't forget the cow open. See you next week. Give me. Thank you. I give you the one. Yeah. Well, it's in my book. Then I when I got to it. Cool, but we are in error. Yep, we're in error. I had a word, but I'm going to be telling you. Woo!